You probably couldn't function without your cell phone, could you? Well, it, it makes business difficult. And, yeah. And people do call on Sundays, not all the time, but it does happen. That's right. Go back where you belong. Guys, come on, let's go. Come on, Tim. Where are you, Chuck? Come on. <laughs> Katie, what are we? We're at the minute and a half mark. Yeah. You want to do a happy birthday? There's two of them today. Two of them? Two of them. <laughs> what do you like, G? Uh, She's got that look on her face like, I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't actually know it. Okay, folks. Uh, Linda, would you be kind enough to stand up? <laughs> Beth, too. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do it. Oh, Two birthdays this week. Beth is today. Go ahead. Starting up. Beth and Linda, happy birthday to you. They told us the answer to that question this morning, but I'm not going to think on them. <laughs> Are you guys ready to start? All right, let's stand up and because turn to, there is power in the blood in number 329.
have a seat. You just can't sing that song without standing up. It, As a good portion of you know, I'm a special education teacher that pays my bills. And for me, school is a slightly different than the general ed teacher. I have to make some very unique lessons for my students that they can accept and use in their own lives. So every week, I look around and try to find a cooking lesson that my kids will enjoy and that their families will enjoy and that they can use in their own lives. So this week, I decided that we would make some chocolate chip cookies for the cooking lesson. Now, about half my students are virtual online and the other half are in the classroom still. But, so I make a batch of chocolate chip cookies ahead of time so that when I do my lesson in class, I put them in and immediately take the finished ones right out of the oven and say, and this is how they look. You know, it's just like TV, you know? I, I have to wear a little pink apron or something maybe, I don't know. Did you sure. tell them you do that? I don't tell them, but I'm pretty I sure they know. Feeling. I'm pretty sure <laughs> they don't, yeah. <laughs> At any rate, um, we made chocolate chip cookies this week and the kids all really enjoyed the lesson because they get to taste those chocolate chip cookies and we put some butterscotch morsels in those chocolate chip cookies as well. And they were quite good. The aroma through the building just kind of flows, you know. And the parents at home can't smell them, but I had quite a few parents say, hey, can you put a few of those cookies in a Ziploc bag and put them in the homework envelope for us? Because we really want to taste those babies. So about half my parents got chocolate chip cookies through the mail now. I'm not sure how whole they were by the time they got them, but I did send chocolate chip cookies home to a lot of my parents, but I still had about two dozen left. So I decided I'd make a few smiles and carry them around the building to the other classrooms and see if anyone would enjoy a chocolate chip cookie. And when you knock on someone's door with a plate full of chocolate chip cookies in your hand and you say, hey, we made chocolate chip cookies today. Uh, would you like to try one? It's like, yeah, give me some of those. You know, it's like, whoo. They are happy to have a chocolate chip cookie. There's very few people that turn down a chocolate chip cookie. You ever notice that? They, they get a lot of smiles. But one of the classrooms I stopped in, an old friend of mine, she invited me in. And I said, hey, um, we made chocolate chip cookies today. Would you like some chocolate chip cookies for your classroom? And she kind of looked at me and she said, no, not really, but I would like another few favor from you. I said, okay. She said, come into the office with me. So I set my chocolate chip cookies down on the table and followed her into the office. She proceeded to tell me a fairly sad story about her oldest daughter who had tried to commit suicide. She didn't know what she was gonna do with her, how to handle the situation. And she wondered, she said, you're a praying man, right? And I said, every chance I get. I said, I can find no better place to go when I have a problem than, than God. She said, would you mind praying for my daughter? I said, I would love to pray for your daughter and I will do it right now. So I took her by the hand and we kneeled down at the table in her office and we prayed for her daughter and we prayed for her and we prayed for her family, and we prayed for the love of Jesus. For the next two days, she was gone from school. When she came back, I saw her walk into the building and I walked right over to her classroom and I said to her, how are things going? She said, I checked my daughter into Pine Rest, but she's doing much better. She's no longer talking about suicide. She feels better about the situation she's in. And I think it's all because of the love that you showed. And I said, that is absolutely true. In Psalm 91, we're told, Whatever dwell, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High 
will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you. From the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Isn't that a wonderful promise from the Lord? Is that love? That is the true love of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you. And you will not find that anywhere else except on your knees. So, with that, let's sing number 348. My Savior's Love. Verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. forward to back and sing number 762 what a day that will be
How many uh, this past week have gotten a call about uh, your warranty is going to expire? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it. I got that this week and I said, I am just so glad that you called me because I've got a vehicle. Nobody will give me a warranty. And they said, oh, Mr. We will. Please, just give us the make, model, and year, and we will get you a warranty that can't be beat. I said, I have been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Okay, what it is it? I said, I have a 1985 Scottsdale Chevy pickup. <laughs> what? I said, yeah, nobody will give me a warranty. Really? What is it? What's the year again? I said, 1985 Scottsdale Chevy pickup. Click. <laughs> Hung up again. Man. I got a lot of clicks. All right. Before we begin, um, my wife said, Bruce, in your group tonight, uh, pray for our president. So let's, uh, let's do that. And his wife. And our country. Father God, we have this assurance of knowing that you are in control. That when empires rise and fall, when governments come and go, when armies uh, amass and disintegrate, you are still there. And what you will for your children can't be taken away. Because whatever happens, like we talked this morning, you've prepared a place for us in glory. But tonight we're praying for our president and his wife. And I would pray that you would continue to use this thing, this illness, this sickness, this virus. And you, Father, in only the way that you can, would turn this around and not only receive glory from this, but that you would actually change the hearts and minds of the citizens of this country that would cause us to repent of our sin as a nation and determine to come back to you. I pray that we all might recover and recover more than just physically, that we might recover spiritually. 
and that as our president and his wife come back from this, that the message on their lips would be praise to you, Father God. And so then we bless, we ask your blessing upon us as your children, as we look into your word tonight. May this psalm be one that resonates with us and gives us a song all week long in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not a name dropper and I don't much care for name droppers. But during the course of my life, I've gotten to meet some people that, uh, uh, well, they may not be famous. They're at least well known. And uh, for this uh, boy from Vesterberg, he get pretty excited about meeting some of these people. And I would imagine that there are a few people that you have always wanted to meet. Maybe secretly, you don't want to say it. But, you know, you're thinking in your heart now, yeah, there's a couple people, Bruce, I wanted to meet. Not because we're starstruck or we want to have a selfie with us that we can put on the internet, but uh, we just want to meet certain people and see what they're like, if they are the same in person as they are, you know, on the big screen. Now, the person that I am about to name isn't necessarily somebody that I wanted to meet. When I come across this illustration, I just thought it was so funny. I wanted to bring that tonight as an example. He's got one of the toughest, grittiest, and no-nonsense reputations in the world. He is instantly recognizable. And his name is Chuck Norris. You ever heard of Chuck Norris? Many of you know him from his action films, and others of you know him from uh, a Walker, Texas Ranger, a television show that lasted eight years. But what you may not know is that before Chuck Norris was a Hollywood star, he was a famous martial artist. Six-time undefeated world professional middleweight karate champion and the first first human being in the Western Hemisphere to earn an eighth degree black belt in Taekwondo. And even at 70 years of age, he's, he's more than 70. You know, he's about Linda's age. <laughs> and even at more than 70 years of age, he still is one tough dude. I discovered some interesting facts while I was looking at this illustration and it tells you just how tough he is. For instance, did you know fear of spiders is arachnophobia? Fear of tight spaces is claustrophobia. Fear of Chuck Norris is logic. <laughs> Chuck Norris has a grizzly bear as a carpet in his house. The bear isn't dead, it's just afraid to move. <laughs> Chuck Norris has already been to Mars, and that's why there are no signs of life. Chuck Norris and Superman once fought each other on a bet. The loser had to start wearing his underwear over his pants. You didn't get that, did you? Oh. No, ne neither did my wife. No. Chuck Norris once counted to infinity. Twice. Did you get that one? When the boogeyman goes to sleep every night, he checks his closet for Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris can drown a fish. When he does a push-up, he isn't lifting himself up, he's pushing the earth down. Chuck Norris doesn't need Twitter because he's already following you. There's no theory of evolution, just a list of creatures that Chuck Norris has allowed to live. Now, in addition to having never met Chuck Norris, I've never had the opportunity to meet an earthly king. Anybody have? Now, there are several good reasons why I've never met an earthly king. Number one, I can't get an appointment. Number two, I don't know one. 
Number three, even if I did and I could, I wouldn't know how to act or what to say because I couldn't go in like I am. That would just be embarrassing. You may be sitting out there tonight saying, well, I never got to meet anybody famous at all. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then I beg to differ with you. It never ceases to amaze me that at any time, day or night, you all have a standing invitation to walk into the very throne room of the King of all kings who created and runs this universe. You can go in anytime you want. You don't have to have an appointment. You don't have to make a reservation. You don't have to have political connections or be worth a certain amount of money. In fact, even when you think that you have left him, you find out that he's not left you. In fact, it's even better. It's not that you get to meet with this king, but that this king wants to meet with you. In fact, he wants to meet with you so much that he has given you the keys to the door and he even tells you how to act and what to say when you show up. You don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be fearful. Anytime you enter into the presence of a king, there are protocols to follow. And there are certain keys that are important uh, uh, to get into the presence of the king of this universe. And so tonight we're going to look at these keys. There are five of them. Five simple things to do in Psalm 100 that will ensure us an audience with the king anytime we desire. Number one, we open the doors into his presence by worshiping God joyfully. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 100. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. This psalm is all about worship. Because worship is so vitally important to God. In fact, the first four of the Ten Commandments deal exclusively with worship. No book in the Bible talks more about worship than the book of Psalms, and no psalm talks more about worship than Psalm 100. Get ready because the worship that we find here is far different than the worship that takes place in most churches and the worship that takes place with most of us when we're alone with God. So the psalmist is doing us a favor. He shows us what worship ought to look like on the outside and what he says should really revolutionize the way we come into God's presence at any time, whether it's Sunday night, whether it's Sunday morning or Wednesday night or a quiet time at home. He says, <clears throat> and you'll find something about me here. He says, real worship always involves shouting, serving, and singing. Now, I might not be good at much, but I can do those three things. I can shout, I can serve, and I can sing. The word for noise in verse 1 Make a joyful noise to the Lord. The word noise literally means a sound that splits the ear. And I made a couple of those this morning, didn't I? Yeah, your ears were splitting. I don't think the psalmist was saying that we need to come to church and scream. Although I've heard it said by a guy, an old preacher named Vance Havner. He said, man, you people can go to a ball game and shout and scream like Indians. But you come to church and you sit there like the ones that used to stand outside the tobacco stores in the old days. Those wooden Indians. He's talking about excitement and energy and enthusiasm. In the book of Revelation, John saw worship going on in heaven. And it was some kind of worship. Without exception, it was exciting, expressive, emotional, and enthusiastic. And oh, I tell you, I can't wait to get there and get watching all those things worshiping God. I don't think our problem with worship, either publicly or privately, is that we show too much emotion. We don't show enough. Now, we don't need to act like a bunch of fanatics. But I'll tell you one thing. It's easier to cool down a fanatic than it is to heat up a corpse. <laughs> Too many churches don't, don't have much energy. 
And I'm not an expert by any means, but I think too often, particularly in our public worship, we walk in and we're real conscious of who is standing around us, in front of us, and behind us. And what I'm saying is I think we ought to stop thinking less about what other people think about us and more about what God thinks about us. It might change the way that we worship. When we come into the presence of God, he ought to know by the way we act and the way we look that we are glad to see him. Now let me just ask you, when you come through those doors, morning, night, or Wednesdays, and you see me, can you tell whether or not I'm glad to see you? Sure you can. Even with a mask on, you can tell I'm smiling. Because my ears, they start wiggling. God should know by our presence that we're glad to see him. Number two, verse two. Serving God gladly. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, Bruce, I thought you were talking about worship. What do you have to go back to that singing for? Where, where, does, where does that come in? Where does service come in? Well, the more personal you get with God, the more you want to serve God, the more you want God to use you, and the more you want God to be blessed by what you can offer. Service is a part of worship. And one of the ways that we can worship God is by serving. Serving God is completely and totally different from serving everything, anyone else. Why, why do you think, go over to Acts chapter 17. Why do you think the Lord tells us to serve him with gladness? <laughs> oh, I love it. Acts 17. <laughs> and verse 25. Let's go back to verse 24. Paul preaching on Mars Hill, says the God who made the world and all things in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. We're to serve God with gladness. Because when we serve him, we're not bearing the burden of meeting his needs. He doesn't have any. We are rejoicing in a service where he meets our needs. God doesn't need us serving him to make him happy. We need to serve God to make us happy. Number three. 100 verse three. Knowing God personally. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. You might think this is redundant, but it really isn't. Because in order to worship God correctly, you've got to worship the right God. You're far better off worshiping the right God, even if you do it poorly, than you are to worship the wrong God and you do it magnificently. The Hebrew word for know doesn't mean to know intellectually. It means to know by experience. The psalmist here isn't talking about head knowledge. He's talking about heart knowledge. You can't worship God correctly until you know God personally. And the psalmist tells us how to do this. You've got to know where there's only one God and that God is the Lord. Now, that may sound simple. But believe it or not, that one sentence summarizes the entire Bible. You know what? You want to know why the Bible was written? I can tell you in one sentence. So that you and I might know the Lord himself is God. And that God himself is Lord. That's how the Old Testament and the New Testament come together. The foundational truth of the Old Testament is that the Lord is God. The foundational truth of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the foundational truth of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is God. We start that in our truth series for our children. 
Back when Jeannie was children's minister, we got this material and we, and we started that teaching them that young. Jesus is God, but Jesus is not the Father. And Jesus isn't the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit isn't the Father. And the Holy Spirit isn't Jesus. God is God. But he's not the Son, and he's not the Holy Spirit. He's the Father. We need to understand how those flow together. Number four, thanking God humbly. Verse four. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. All I've talked about so far has just gotten us an entrance through the door. But before you can get to the king, you've got to go through the gate, and then you've got to get into the court, and the key to the gate is gratitude. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. We're told not to come in and enter his gates with no ticket, no clearance, no credentials. But we also go in with no griping, and no whining, and no complaining. <laughs> Of course, you all are here on Sunday nights because you're super Christian, so I'm just preaching to the choir. But I tell you, and it's been this way for 25 years. You know some of these people. They come into this building, and I wonder why they come. They don't like anything about it. They don't like the music. They don't like the preaching. They don't like the people. All they do is gripe and complain and whine. Now, if I'm wondering why they're there, don't you think God wonders? What are you coming for? Man, all I can think of is Disney's not on anymore, so there's nothing else to do. Oh, for the days of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Two keys that will always open the door into God's presence. The first key is thanksgiving. If there are any people on this planet that ought to be thankful, it ought to be the people sitting in this room. We will eat more food in a day than most of the world will eat in a month. We will drive air-conditioned automobiles forgetting that billions of people never even own a car. We've got more clothes hanging in our closets, and you may not, but your preacher can attest to that, than the average person in the world will ever see in their lifetime. We will sleep in a bed when much of our world will sleep on a dirt floor. Thanksgiving is the music that brightens the face of God. It's the spark that warms the heart of God. It's the love that kisses the hand of God. And I don't care how bad off your situation is, everyone has something that they can be thankful to God for. I heard one time about a preacher, he'd been facing repeated attacks. <laughs> this isn't me. <laughs> Boy, I laughed when I read it. Gil, Gil and Con, Conrad, you, you'll laugh at yeah, because you. What I heard about this preacher: repeated attacks from this negative, very critical woman in his church. Every week, he'd get at least one ugly letter from her. At every service, she'd come up to him afterwards and have something negative to say. His sermon was too long. His dress was too casual. He talked too fast. He talked too slow. Always something negative. Well, it began to wear on this young man. I mean, he was just new in the ministry. Week after week after week, this woman said, you shouldn't wear that suit. It doesn't go with your coloring. What is up with your hair? Man, could you clip the, the hairs out of your ears? They're just sticking out. We can see them from the back. On and on it went, and he just didn't know what to do. And so he called his dad. And he said, Dad... I have got this problem. And he told him what it was. And dad said, I've got a simple solution, son. The next time that she comes up to you and begins to gripe and complain and criticize, when she finishes, take her by the hand. 
and say, Mrs. Smith, may I just pray with you? And get down on your knees with her and simply say this prayer. Dear God, I want to thank you that this lady is not my wife. <laughs> Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Number five, praise God constantly. With thanksgiving, this is what it says. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. With thanksgiving you get into the gate, but with praise you get into the court. God wants you to come into his presence. And when you do, before you ask him for anything, thank him for what he's done and praise him for who he is. When you think about God, who created you when he didn't have to, who loves you even though you don't deserve it, who sent his son to die for your sin, and who even now is creating an eternal home for you in heaven. How can you not be filled with praise every time you come into his presence? Give thanks to him and bless his name. Why are we to praise him? Why are we to thank him? Why are we to be shouting and serving and singing? Why should we be so enthusiastic in our worship? Why should we make it a point in our life to carry God with us everywhere we go? To always live in his presence? The answer is in verse 5. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations. God is good all the time. And all the time God is good. He loves us with an everlasting <coughs> love. <clears throat> that will never quit. He's faithful to us at all times. At all places. And never fails to keep his promises. I read a story one time about a young Navy officer who had made his first trip on a destroyer across the ocean. He had impeccable training, so he was given the assignment to take the destroyer out of the harbor and bring it back to the United States. Since it was his first major assignment, he wanted to do it just right. Now, he was a bright young officer, and in a moment, the deck was buzzing with action. He was barking commands here and there and everything was moving like a Swiss clock. The destroyer made its way out of the harbor without one flaw, which is a very difficult maneuver. They were on their way in record time when someone came to the young commander and said, you have a message from the captain. He thought it was strange because it was a radio message. But he read it and this is what the captain said. <clears throat> Commander, you've done an excellent job. You've done it with great speed and with dispatch. You have dotted every I and crossed every T. You've gone by the book, but there is an unwritten rule that you have overlooked. I must call it to your attention. The next time you leave the harbor, make certain the captain is on board. That officer in his haste had left the harbor with the most important person of all missing. The captain of the ship. I don't care how wise you think you are. I don't care how great you think your plans are for your life. I don't care how much you think you're capable of handling everything that's going on around you. You had better make sure that the captain of your life, almighty God is on your ship. Would you pray with me, please? Father, it is such a joy to be in your presence because you are the author of joy. When you tell us that we have been made in your image, one of the things that just stands out is your sense of humor, the laughter that you give us, we can hear it in a brook that gurgles by. We can see it in the way that the baby animals entertain us. And we can see it in our own lives by the gaffes that we make. 
still you love us. I pray that we would do a better job of coming into your presence and giving you praise and blessing your name. May we begin this week in Jesus' name. Amen.